Thank you for joining us for Duets, Black Creatives in Conversation, the Warfield series that brings artists to the University of Texas for lively exchanges with members of the campus and greater Austin communities. This evening, I'm thrilled to welcome author Brian Washington. He is a National Book Award 5 Under 35 honoree and the author of the collection Lot. He has written for The New Yorker, The New York Times, The New York Times Magazine, BuzzFeed, Vulture, The Paris Review, Tin House, One Story, Bon Appetit, GQ, The All, and Catapult. And as I'm sure you know, and if you don't, now you do, Brian has recently published the beautiful novel Memorial, um, which is available from your local booksellers. So I hope that you'll seek this out, also your local libraries. Brian lives in Houston. Joining him in conversation is Shana Frazier. Um, Shana is a recent graduate of the New Writers Project at the University of Texas at Austin. She earned her BFA from the University of Houston in 2015. Her work can be found in Found Me Magazine, a publication about Houston, shout out to H-Town tonight, um, and its inhabitants. She is currently writing about race, magical realism, martyrdom, and third ward Houston, Texas. Um, so again, let's all give a word of thanks to H-Town for shaping these two remarkable writers as we welcome them to the virtual stage. Um, Brian and Shana's conversation will be followed by an open um, Q&A, and you can use the handy box in the lower right-hand side of your screens to share your questions. Um, and um, yeah, enough of me. Let's hear from uh, Brian and Shana. So uh, thank you both. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Uh, thank hey. you all so much at the Warfield Center. Oh, go ahead, Brian. Oh no, after you, no, please, please take center stage. <laughs> I just, I just wanted to do a quick thank you to the Warfield Center. Uh, thank you, Justice. Thank you, Dr. Welts. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, a quick go Cougs, real quick, because uh, H Town is in the house. And after you, Brian, go ahead. No, please. I'd, I'd also like to give <laughs> a shared thank you um, for everyone for putting this together. To Shana for joining and moderating and keeping everything intact and also for folks watching and taking the time out of their evening. All right, so I'm in Memorial. Obviously, I have read it. If I didn't, this would be weird. <laughs> Not too weird. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> um, I have it here. I've taken the book jacket off because I'm real precious with my book jackets. You can ask folks. I get weird about it. Um, <laughs> but I have, first off to say, just like, wow, like five years has passed since I first read your short story, Grace. I don't know if you remember that short story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do actually. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, I do, yeah. But it hasn't yeah. every year felt hasn't every day felt like a year for like the past like, yeah for nine sure. months or <laughs> this something. is the longest fastest year ever <laughs> the minor century yeah. <laughs> um but yeah I mean thinking about that short story and thinking about memorial it's just like wow I'm so I'm so in awe of like how far you've come but also how much you've been able to retain that that sense of self. Um, I mean, yeah, it just, it feels like the same writer, but just, you know, I don't want to say well seasoned, but yeah, like there's something, there's something about it that has a different kind of electricity, even though that, that story before that I keep referencing that other people are like, what is she talking about? <laughs> Deep cut. <laughs> That, that story before still has that, it still has a lot of that, um, I guess, glimmer that Memorial and Lot both share. And um, I wanted to ask you in terms of short stories, because I know you came out with Lot before this. Um, and I mean, you kill it in the short story game, to be, to be frank, you do. Um, and I just, as I was reading Memorial, I did feel this unusual, I guess, feeling <laughs> in terms of, I feel like this is a short story that has been turned into a novel 
but it's retained all of the wonder that you get in a short story. Um, and I have never read anything like that, to be honest. Um, when I think about other books that are kind of playing with form, so to speak, you know, I can think of like Claudia Rankine's Citizen, um, maybe even Carol Masso's Ava. Like there's something happening there where the line isn't, is it all poetry? Is it all narrative? Is it prose? Like, what is it? And I feel like here, yes, we're firmly rooted in prose, but also it's like, yeah, it's just bending this idea of you can have a short story that's a novel and a novel that's actually a short story. And it's not, I don't know, it, they're, they're jiving really well together. Um, and I, I just wanted to know if you could speak to that a little bit. What's that process of, of kind of retaining this like quiet beauty in this novel? Thank you not only for your question, but also the way that you asked it, right? I feel like to be read in that way is a very rare thing. And that's also very much a gift. So, you know, thank you um, more generally first. But Memorial actually began as a short story, right? And it was under 3,000 words. I think it was maybe six pages or so if you spaced it of like triple space the font. And I wrote it for a friend's zine. Um, and I was in the midst of writing what I thought would be the follow-up to Lot, and that was going very poorly, and it wasn't quite doing what I wanted it to do, I think largely because I wasn't terribly interested in it, which mm -hmm. isn't something that I could have articulated at the time, but now, you know, you have this, and you sort of see where your interests lie. But in the midst of trying and failing to write that project, I would talk to friends about the short story and also the sort of characters and the revolutions that those characters were navigating and the concerns that they had were ones that stuck me and struck me and the characters themselves were entities that i hadn't quite figured out yet despite having finished the story and despite having gained distance from the story and i think that what largely drove me to finish the novel to begin with is what felt like the unknowability of those characters and the unknowability of how they revolved around one another in Congress and by wanting to know, you know? Yeah. So much of writing the book and drafting it and editing it because it went through something like 11 drafts or so was trying to figure out what the ending was. And I feel like if I knew where they would end up from the outset, I would not have stuck with it. Um, Cause it took yeah. about three years to write. And that's, that's quite a long time to focus on anything, let alone like a series of fictional characters like on the page. But because I didn't know where they ended up and I wanted to know where they ended up, it felt deeply important to me to at least try to see yeah. what that would look like because it felt as if though that were the book that I would want to read. And it wasn't one within that particular emotional pocket that you know, I tried to imbue memorial with, with those very specific and particular communities that I hadn't really read on the page before interacting with one another from a place of love, right? Or at least with the capacity of love and a place of attempt wanting to connect and the capacity for connection. So much of that jump from the short story form to the novel form was retaining those same concerns that I had and the same questions that I had. But I think that the novel space gave me a much longer canvas yeah. in order to work through those questions. I still wasn't interested in answering them. And I think I knew from the outset that I wouldn't come up with an answer to any of those particular questions of whether a character can find home, of whether they can find connection, of what it meant to be okay as a person in a sort of singular sense and also a person among people in a collective sense, whether with a romantic partner, whether it's with one's family or someone who's in that sort of liminal space between friend and significant other. But it also felt really important to me that the answer not be prescriptive and that the answer itself be the journey that the characters navigated, you know, and sort of allowing room to operate outside of binaries in the book. And that would have been quite a lot to do in another short story 
featuring yeah. those characters. So inevitably it became a novel. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the way you just said, like, there's no prescriptive answer in the novel. I mean, I felt that the whole way through, like anytime Mike and Benson would do something, I would just be there like, why are you doing this thing again? Like, don't do that. You know that it's oh. going to be, you know, it's going to result in this because you've already done it before. But at the same time, I was just like, there's nothing else that they could do. Like anytime that Mike would say something that would cut deep, I would just be like, oh, Mike, why? But also, yeah, exactly. You are the kind of person that would do this. And it just, I don't know, it caught me off guard a lot of times just reading it and just being kind of like, all right, so what's the end game here? But also in a more true to life sense, like it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work where you have like this very cool, easy answer of, oh, this is all I have to do and that's it, it'll be fine. And it's like, no, it's gonna be more complex. There's never gonna be a clear answer. And I think that you do that so well in this book. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the way that silence operates in the novel. I mean, it's strange to say that the novel is spare when it's 300 pages, but there's a lot of, I guess, um, I don't wanna say scarcity with words, but particularity with words. You're being very careful with the things that people do choose to say and what they uh, what they hold back. Um, and I just, I guess I wanna just know like, what, what did it take to get there in terms of, let me narrow the question per se, like with Benson, like it isn't, there's something happening distinctly in both parts where in Mike's part, it's really loud. Everything about his part is loud and you can, you can hear it from him when he talks, but even beyond that, it's, you can hear the street in a different way. Like they'll be in the same house and it's heard differently than in Benson's part, which seems quiet throughout. I mean, I thought never in my life did I think Third Ward would sound quiet, but in Benson's part, it does sound quiet even when people are being noisy. Um, I just wanna know, I guess, how, how did you get there? How did you decide what sounds needed to come into play for you know the different parts of the novel and for each character. Yeah, so again, I have to say that it's a gift to be read in this regard, you know? And a lot of ways my secret reading of the novel is that Benson is ultimately someone who learns to speak up for himself. And Mike is ultimately someone who learns how to listen to the folks around them and speaking up for Benson's needs, right? being cognizant of what Benson actually wants and then Benson articulating them is one journey, whereas Mike's is learning to sort of intuit the needs yeah. of others, perhaps even the ones that are less discernible to them. And I think that communication was something that I really circled around for the novel and not only communication, but also connection in the ways that people either come together or don't because yeah. the math problem for me, so to speak, was that I wanted the novel to be one in which each of the characters wanted to connect with one another and each of the characters wanted to cross that gap, so to speak, to learn about the folks surrounding them, the folks that they were entangled with. That's not really the question that I was interested in proffering. Like the one that I thought was fascinating to sort of untangle was how they could do that. And if they were able to discern what the other character needed, right? Like if Ben was able to discern what Mike, his partner wanted and needed, even if Mike couldn't articulate that and vice versa, if Mitsuko, who's Mike's mom, was able to discern what Ben needed or wanted, even if he couldn't perhaps articulate that, would those parties be willing to give them that thing? Or would they be willing to show them that thing or be willing 
to make concessions or to perhaps lose out on the transaction of interactions in order to make sure that the people around them were given the comfort and pleasure that they perhaps desired or the comfort and pleasure that they were seeking out with one another. And sometimes that gap was crossed through dialogue, okay? but oftentimes dialogue fell short in the way that it can fall short in actual life, right? Two people talking and perhaps not immediately connecting, right? Or talking and wishing one another well, but perhaps not having the language in order for that connection to be a seamless one, right? So that Ben can talk to his father and both of them can speak from a place of love, but because Benson's father doesn't have the language of acceptance that's been codified and understood to be the language of acceptance, it can seem like something else, right? Like he can seem deeply yeah. homophobic. And yet Benson has the context to know that that's not where his father's coming from, right? So the yeah. narrative in which binaries exist, like there's an iteration of that narrative where the partner can't speak to their partner and so they're a bad partner or the father doesn't have the language to speak to his queer son so it's a bad father and that felt reductive and also not terribly true to life because I think that oftentimes we ourselves are constantly making those negotiations whether it's with family members whether it's with partners whether it's with friends or strangers or strangers who become friends or something else so trying to figure out what each character wanted and why they wanted it was important to sort of decipher like what the silences meant for them and also trying to untangle what happened when mistranslation occurred whether like a literal mistranslation or figurative, figurative translation could that gap be filled with something else whether it's through texting whether it's through yeah. physicality whether it's through the sending of photos or through cooking the sharing of a meal sort of congregating around a culinary language yeah the question of how people just are together like how do you just be with another person as a person was you know again like not one that I thought I think there was an answer to and I certainly didn't think it would be interesting to read a novel that said okay this is how you become the perfect partner or the perfect son <laughs> or the perfect parent or whatever, so much as extrapolating the many different ways that you can just sort of be. Yeah. So writing a book in which many different things are true simultaneously became the goal. And a part of that goal was allowing the space for silences between each of those ways of being and those ways of behaving that the characters revolve around one another. Yeah. So you said something about context, and it reminded me of a line from the book. Um, I believe Benson says, there's the thing that happens, and there's all the shit that happens around it. Um, and I think reading this, I thought, damn, yeah, like that makes so much sense. And there are so many times in the book where you see something where out of context, it just is wild. I mean, the scene with Mitsuko and Benson going to the uh, to the H Mart for the first time and that interaction with the cashier, and it's just like, whoa, that's crazy that she would say something like that. But at the same time, it's like it's actually not crazy that Benson wouldn't condemn her for it. And in the sense of like, does she? Is it? I guess. Contextually, is it meant as bad as she could possibly say it? Is it like the worst thing in the world? Um, but also this idea that, yeah, you're const you may be in those situations more often than you think. And I feel like Benson probably is in those situations like a lot and he might be able to shrug it off because it's like, you know what, that's, you know, that's life. Like I've had, I've dealt with that before. I'm not gonna, you know, explode on every person that decides to do something like this. Um, the same with, you know, his father, that idea that you're right, like, you are kind of bartering how this relationship is going to work, you know, am I going to totally discard you because you don't know how to articulate your acceptance of me and who I am, 
or am I going to let you, you know, say a gay joke and then just kind of move on and hope that we can get past that point and understand like, you don't dislike me. You don't hate me. It's just a matter of, you don't know how to communicate what your love is to me. Um, yeah, I mean, that happens so often. And I just, again, yeah, I, I felt like in a different book, that would have been such a heavy moment. And it would have been so, I don't want to say drawn out and like dramatized, but it just, it would have been different. Whereas, you know, Benson being a person of color, being queer, he may have had to deal with that so often in life that this is just, you know, something that he can, it's not a matter of he wants to shrug it off, but it's also like, you got to keep living if, you know, if, if these things keep happening to you. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I thought so often, like, man, what would I do in that situation? I would have said this, this, and this, and how dare you, and all this stuff. And then I thought about it, and I was like, no, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have said anything. Have you I seen I May Destroy You? Have you seen, like, the final episode of I May Destroy You? Uh, I haven't. Oh, okay. So I can't talk about it then. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm well, going to watch it now. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. Because it's, it's that exact thing, right? Like there's the, there's a way in which, you know, there's the situation itself. And then there are like the actions that we perceive ourselves perhaps wanting to take or the ones that we would take if the context yeah. were the same, or we have the sort of foresight going back to it. And then there's what we actually do. And then like what we actually like need to do. You yeah. Know? Like yeah. I think the memorial, like that exact question was one that I was really interested in exploring, right? Yeah. Like what does the accumulation of microaggressions and transgressions over a lifetime do to one's perception and internalization and ultimately shrugging off of those microaggressions and transgressions? And I think that I was hyper cognizant of how there is an iteration of a version in a parallel universe of Memorial where every time he brushes shoulders with like some white guy or if something racist happens, like something that is blatantly like capital R racist happens, it becomes a moment yeah. in the text, you know, like that becomes like its own chapter with like a learning curve and, you know, a moment of understanding <laughs> and everyone like, you know, they kiki at the end and like decide and now we've like figured out racism, right? But that's not really a book that I'm interested in reading and it didn't feel true to being like a similar of life and so Benson notices yeah things right like he notices when someone runs into him he notices when someone makes an off comment or when someone like locks their car like in the garage multiple times upon his approach or if someone closes a door upon his approach or opens a door or fails to open the door upon his approach but because it's a part of his life yeah and you know he's sort of living in a state of simultaneity the same way that we all do as marginalized folks in this country it is some it's a thing that happens and then he moves on because it isn't the arc or the nexus point of his life and i think the same is true or i wanted the same to be true for mike as well who undergoes the sort of transgressions of fetishization of yeah. racism of being cast off or ignored solely because of his identity or his physical appearance and yet that is not the crux of his life so yeah he sees it and he recognizes it and he lives with it but it isn't his narrative in the same way that the reverberations of white supremacy or marginalized folks in this country like we you can't you don't ignore it right like you yeah. live around it and you live with it and you combat it but that isn't like solely your narrative so I wanted to write a novel in which characters were not classified solely by their trauma yeah. it, like it was important to me that Benson's being a pause queer cis man in the south wasn't the crux and crucible of his arc in and of itself and it was important to me that mike's being and feeling displaced upon his return to japan was not like the 
crux and crucible of his narrative so much as that it was a part of his journey and a yeah. part of their journey as they still fell in love and fell out of love and had things that they liked and disliked and laughed about and did not laugh about. So trying to write a narrative in which a character's marginalization is not the sole engine of whatever tension is existing in the novel was important to me because I think that there's a way in which marginalized characters and perhaps more specifically the memorial yeah. queer characters from marginalized backgrounds can solely exist within the transgressions that they navigate or have to endure or those microaggressions or traumatic events that do occur and those books sell a lot of copies you, know, <laughs> you can make a lot of money doing that but it's not the book that I wanted to write solely because it was the sort of thing that I wanted to read yeah and I think this is kind of gonna touch on my next thought in terms of those transgressions aren't just coming from people you know that they don't know they're coming from people that are considered family um, or family's family, your spouse's family. Um, and I think a lot of it, you know, this constant idea like, oh, home is where the heart is, you know, but I think for a lot of people, home is where the hurt is, so to speak. And having to confront that hurt, you know, with both Ben and Mike is, it's, it's devastating in a way, but it's also one of those things where you're happy for them. You're happy that they get to figure out the way to talk to these people in their lives and to say what they need to say or not say anything at all anymore. Um, and I just, yeah, like, I guess in terms of how home plays into this novel, I mean, it's, clearly central um but I don't know I guess I couldn't imagine it if Mike didn't leave home for home um it would be totally yeah it would be just a totally different thing if it didn't happen that way and I, I guess I'm trying to get into this concept of location in the novel um because so much of it takes place in Houston but then also so much of it takes place in Osaka. Um, and I just wanted to know, I mean, obviously you've been to Houston, you live there, of course, <laughs> but Osaka, I believe you've been there. Um, and how is it, I guess, when you're writing these locations and you're writing these concepts of home, are you, I guess, are you particularly careful about the details because you want them to be correct or are you more after the kind of atmosphere ambiance around what it means to be in these places and by places I mean Houston and Osaka but even beyond that or I guess in a smaller sense home itself this isn't a deflection but how is it for yourself you know like writing about the third ward and writing about the sort of myths that are both within it, I presume, and also around it, like, how is it on your end? Uh, I would say when I'm writing about Third Ward, there are times when I really want to get the details, like, if I'm, I don't know, describing a particular intersection, I want to get that exactly right. But for the most part, I think it doesn't matter um, if it's, all the way correct, as long as you get the kind of, you get that flavor of what Third Ward is, you know? Um, yeah, so in some sense, it's that really loud nature of Third Ward of everyone is awake all the time. And, you know, depending on what part you live in, there are a lot of gunshots or there are no gunshots and there's just a lot of music or someone is just outside singing at the top of their lungs because you know they're grateful for something and you have no idea what that is but you're party to it all of a sudden um so yeah i i think it i guess it depends on the situation if it needs to be like rock solid details or if it needs to be just do you understand the sense of community here 
Yeah. Yeah, I think that I was in a similar sphere in the midst of writing Memorial. I think that for Lot, I, at least from the outset, was keenly misguided in the sense that I had to get everything correct and in the middle of writing that particular project the light bulb went off that there is no correct for a city yes. and that a city is singular just by way of its form right like your iteration of houston and my iteration of houston and every other houstonian's iteration of houston is true despite them perhaps being slightly or radically different in some cases so for memorial I, well, I should probably preface for Osaka, like I, I'm not in our current pandemic state, but for the past uh, five years or so, I'm usually there once or twice a year for a good while of the year, mostly just to visit friends. And I think my, you know, my initial trips um, were just to visit friends. It wasn't with the intention of monetizing yeah. the narrative <laughs> of the experience. It's just like the sort of like hang out and like visit Sento and just like around people. But I think that eventually it occurred to me that there was a warmth that I have been privileged to experience and a warmth that I've been privy to within that particular city and yeah. the only other place that I could draw a direct line to as far as the, the flavor of that warmth was Houston and yeah. while Houston and Osaka like they could not be more different in a lot of ways. The fact that they shared that warmth for me and yeah. the fact that that warmth felt very singular, felt like a narrative there, right? So in many ways, writing memorial was my trying to figure out what that connection looked like insofar as it existed at all. And I think that when I'm thinking of place and when I'm thinking of like home as a place, what is really important to me is trying to capture how a character is existing within the context of that particular geographic point. Because one of the questions that I was interested in trying to play with for Memorial was how someone reacted to finding themselves in a context in which they're no longer told who they should be or mm -hmm. who they should become or how they should be. Right? So it became fascinating to me to take a character like Mike, who is Japanese American, who lives in the third ward, who, and I should probably say more generally for folks who are familiar with the third ward, third ward is one of the country's oldest historically black neighborhoods, um, among many other things. But for Mike to live in the third ward and to think of himself being a part of it, and for his neighbors to think of him as a part of it, and to have a symbiotic relationship with that place right like if I met Mike like out in the world like in the third world I wouldn't think twice of it in the third world's current iteration yeah. but to take him and to put him back in Osaka where I suppose at first glance one might say okay that is your home actually not you know the third world to see who he became or didn't become was interesting and that felt like a narrative to me in the same way that I felt like a narrative to have someone like Benson, who is just this queer black cis guy, and the closest iteration of home that he finds himself privy to or taken by isn't a geographic point, but in the yeah. form of you know this older Japanese woman, yeah. right? Who for any number of reasons accepts him despite their Sort of mistranslations and their misconnections and their misfrequencies and the question of whether home was like a person or whether it was a place or whether it was a history in a place or you know a direct lineage to a place or whether home was like a feeling was one that was really prevalent to me and impressed itself upon me for the duration of writing the novel and it was one of the questions that i was least interested in yeah. answering right i wanted to allow each character to sort of have that dynamism to change their mind and sort of give them the benefit of the doubt and the freedom to change their mind which is part of the reason that the novel ends up in the sort of pocket that it does 
but that I mean I think it's just as you said like wanting I took a lot of joy in writing the characters arc Mike and then solely through seeing them you know sort of become the people that they ultimately yeah. became right like not necessarily them ending up as like good people as like good partners so much as them exploring what goodness meant to them respectively or badness meant to them respectively or what was in that sort of liminal space in between and what happened if they want the bad thing right what if the bad thing is the good thing for them or what if the good thing for them in one context is actually not the good thing for them Uh, sort of giving each of them the space and you know the intent was give every character the space to sort to realize that problematize that within their own terms was really important to me yeah I mean just that idea that you know you I guess uh which character says it I believe it's Tan that says you shouldn't make a home out of other people I was just like wow like that is exactly what these characters are doing I mean you know Mike is doing it even though yeah Osaka is his home you know his birthplace but like he's also doing it with Iju and like trying to recreate this idea of home with him. Um, Or just as you said, as Ben is doing it with Mitsuko. And I just, I was like, it is impossible to pin down home as just a place for some people. Like it goes so far beyond place. Um, And yeah, like, you can be anywhere and if those people that you consider home aren't there it then it's not quite home um but also home extending outside of just people but also the atmosphere that's created particularly around cooking in this novel i mean food is such a currency here um and i just i felt like every time you saw Mitsuko or Mike cooking, it just felt like they, this is the only way they know how to say, I'm sorry, sometimes, like, I don't, and I just, I wish for them, I'm just like, it wouldn't be hard to just, you know, go up to someone and say, my bad, I didn't mean it that way, or I didn't (laughs) want to do that, but instead, Uh it's just like, you know, um, I saw a meme the other day that said, Black parents don't, they don't say I'm sorry. They just tell you dinner is on the table, and that's okay. It. They cook rice, and then <laughs> they tell you it's done. They're like it's so you're good. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt like you know that of course extends to Mike and Mitsuko as well. Like they don't and Iju as well. Like they're not. We're not saying we're sorry in this family. You're either going to eat this delicious meal, or you're going to go sit in the corner by yourself. There's no options here. Um, and but also with the cooking in the in the novel, I was hungry, like genuinely, you know, like I'm trying to think of the only other book that has made me hungry like this, maybe Hunger Games for very different reasons. Okay. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But this book, like every time I would get to a meal, I'm just like, yeah, I want some of that. I want some of those potato croquettes. I don't know what they're having, but let me have some. And, but it, it, it also just kind of inspired that like, all right, this is piecemeal, like this is a peace offering, like in, in no better way than I can do it. And I mean, I know that you are always cooking on Instagram. I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't even. Bane of my existence. <laughs> <just like. laughs> Instagram activity. But, you know. Yeah, I don't know how you have time to write and to cook up a storm, but you really be cooking. And I just, I guess, yeah, like, what got you into wanting to write about food in this way where it's not just like, ah, let me show them this recipe that I know how to do, but it's more of like, let me, let me bear myself before you and like, let me humble myself in a way and give you this thing that I know how to make, um, that I prepared, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. What got you into that? The humbling of it in a lot of ways, you know, because I think that the act of preparing a meal, the act of like preparing a dish for someone is an offering in a lot of ways. And it is also an act of trust, 
uh, you're trusting that they won't reject this thing yeah. that you've shown them, right? Whether it's a large meal, right? Whether it's like a Thanksgiving dinner or like a circumspect Thanksgiving dinner because we're in quarantine and we shouldn't be going anywhere or whether it's just a sort of late night dish that you're cooking for a significant other or like a drunken dish that you pick for a friend because you want them to feel better the evening of or the next morning, right? When yeah. I think that in the midst of cooking a dish, like from the very inception of the act, there is a trajectory and then there is also an arc because if you're starting to cook something, you are by way of that going to finish cooking it, right? And then you are going to consume it. So the sole act of cooking in and of itself is a narrative. Right? Mm -hmm. It has a beginning, it has a bridge, and then it also has an end. So yeah. for me, I think that the two forms like of writing, like constructing a narrative and also constructing a meal are tied to one another in that regard. Right? Like they're not terribly different to me. And I think that for Memorial, what I was interested in parsing was this question of what void the preparation of a meal and the sharing of a meal could fill for connection and for love and for care that perhaps dialogue couldn't or perhaps physicality couldn't yeah. or proximity couldn't. Like I wanted to know like what role the sharing of cuisine could do in that regard because everyone eats. Right. Um, yeah. And in many ways, the kitchen as a sort of narrative device is endlessly fascinating to me, at least because it is the one room in a home or a living space that every character will pass through at some point in some capacity for some reason. Um, and if they inhabit that space with the other folks in their living space, there's a narrative there. And there's a question if they time their passengers so that they avoid certain characters or other folks in the living space, there's a question there and there's a narrative there. And there's a narrative in the amount of time that they spend after the meal. And also there's a question in the actual act of preparation, like who partakes in that preparation, like who is bringing the labor upon themselves in order to provide that sort of comfort and pleasure. So for Ben in the novel, his arc was one of someone who learns how to utilize the act of cuisine in order to say what he wants in order to give yeah. people pleasure. And he was someone who at the beginning of the book, he scrambled eggs are just a miracle to him. And by the <laughs> end of it, he's cooking in tandem with his partner. Like that felt like a tangible arc as did Mike's intended culinary arc where he's someone who has a more stable culinary foundation and, and a more stable culinary base, but his arc is one of trying to learn how to intuit the needs and desires of the folks around him in lieu yeah. of imparting his will solely upon them. Whereas for Mitsuko, like she's the one character for the duration of the book who is constantly comforting the folks around her, like from the very outset, like she lands back in Houston, which is a city that she lived in for a time. And she had a really rough go of it to see her son. And her son immediately tells her like, oh, like I'm leaving you to go see my strange father. Also, I'm leaving you with my maybe partner and I don't know when I'm going to be back. Yeah. Any number of ways that Mitsuko could have acted or reacted to that scenario, but she wakes up the next morning and the first thing that she does for Ben is to cook him a meal to create like a stable foundation of comfort, a stable sort of yeah. platform from which all of her things stem and they certainly have their ups and downs over the course of their relationship but constantly coming back to this refrain of I'm going to cook for you and then I'm going to teach you how to cook for yourself how to give this comfort and pleasure to yourself and also for you to give it to others so that yeah. at, at the end of the book when she is in a position where she's not cooking where she's no longer partaking in that labor it's the first time really that she is able to tell a story where she's able to give a narrative because she's in that, that labor that is a part of that transaction is no longer the end of it that she is occupying. So really trying to figure out how 
the preparation of a meal, the sharing of a meal, and the inhabiting of the space that a meal surrounds can make for more fruitful right, relationships or more fruitful connections. And also what happens when those connections are missed or if they're misfires, like the act of Mike constantly cooking for his father and a dish not quite hitting, or yeah. Mike cooking for Benson and Benson enjoying it, but knowing that saying otherwise or ignoring it will hurt Mike and so intentionally doing that. So really trying to figure out what connections could be formed through food and also the limitations of those connections as they move from context to context. Yeah. I mean, that scene where Mike and Ben are cooking together, I mean, it just felt like finally, finally they know how to work together, they know how to communicate with each other. But, you know, we see how things turn out and it's just like, so odd, so odd that, you know, like that journey went that way. Well, both of their journeys went that way where they are finally, you know, in sync and then they're not. And it's not, but it's not one of those situations where you feel like, oh, boo, they should just, you know, they should just work it out. It's mm -hmm. it's one of those things, as, as you were saying before, it felt inevitable. Like, yeah, you're sometimes you're in someone's life for a time and, you know, it's not like necessarily like a means to an end kind of deal, but you do figure some things out. And I'm just, I think I'm just stunned by how, not how well they took it in the end, but like how, how well I took it in the end, I think. It's just like, it didn't, it felt so organic that it would happen that way. Um, I mean, even the idea of Mike um, meeting Omar, I was just like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, you could do that. Like this, this makes sense. And, or Mike telling, you know, Benson about Tan and everything and, it just, I don't know, there's something about this book that feels so oddly true without being a slap in the face kind of true. Like it's not a heavy handed deal. It's just, that's life. And things happen the way they happen, no matter how you wanted them to turn out. Um, yeah, so I think my only other question had to do with um, Ahmad. I mean, he's such oh, a- great... I haven't gotten to talk about Ahmad at all like, in anything that I've done for this book. So this is really exciting. Every, every time he shows up on the page, I'm just like, yeah, you tell them, you go on strike, you sit here and tell him how to do a freaking crossword. You do it however um, you want. and. You know, that idea that Ahmad is there for the conversation towards the end. And he's like, oh, he just, he just says that to everybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, he's, it's not about him being like a charming kid. Like kids, of course, are like brutally honest. They always are. Um, but there's something about the way that Ben communicates with Ahmad that I don't understand sometimes. I'm just like, wow, if you could just, you know, transfer these skills to all of your other relationships. <laughs> Things um, would be a little bit different, but I don't know. Ahmad is such a, I think he's such a crucial character in terms of actually showing us this other side of Ben where he's, he always listens and he's always patient, but there's just another layer happening when a mod comes into play where it's like, I'm willing to wait for you to tell me what you need to tell me and to do it in the way that you choose, um, which I feel comes kind of full circle with Mike and Ben's relationship in terms of, in the end, what do they choose to say to each other and what do they choose to hold back? Um, but yeah, I think I just wanted to brag on Ahmad for a minute because I was just like, yeah, yeah, I haven't gotten to talk about Ahmad like in any capacity for like anything from this book. So thank you for this gift. Um, I think that 
it was just inherently interesting to me for Vincent to be a character for whom the act of connecting and the thought of connection was an act, like a very tangible physical thing that he had to will himself to do from the outset of the novel. And for that act to only feel more natural and less forced when he was interacting with the oldest character in yeah. the text, Mitsuko, and also the youngest central character in the text, Ahmad, right? And it was apparent to me, at least, that the book in a lot of ways would live or die on Mitsuko's character and also on Ahmad's character in that I think that Ahmad is the only other character aside from Mitsuko for whom the act or the fact of many different things being true at the same time isn't something that he recoils from. Yeah. It was interesting to have the oldest character in the text and the youngest character in the text operate with that mindset. And so Amat does childish things because he is a child, but simultaneously he's able to decipher situations and to speak with a clarity that the adults around him cringe from in yeah. a lot of ways or they shirk from in a lot of ways because he has an understanding that it can be true that his brother Omar wants to be in a relationship with Ben and it can be true that Ben is someone that Ahmad sees every day just by way of his being at the after space and it can also be true that Mike can sit with Omar and also Ben and also Ahmad and share a meal with one yeah. another and each of those things can operate in tandem and it can also be true that Ahmad feels he needs to go on strike because he's not getting you know computer time or that you know he decides not to speak to anyone for a week because the fact of all of these things being true, I feel like the act of understanding them is a burden in yeah. a lot of ways, right? Like I think it is a physical burden to have that acknowledgement, to sort of accept that A is being true doesn't diminish, B is being true doesn't diminish C's being true. And while I think that Mitsuko can navigate that because she has the experience, she has the age, she's sort of done the time to yeah. see that that can be the case. Ahmad is still quite young. So his understanding that this is the case doesn't negate its being a burden. So really yeah. playing with how one internalizes what they accept or don't accept between Mitsuko and Ahmad specifically, but also each of the characters more generally, like with parts of themselves, they perhaps close themselves off yeah. to what they're willing to accept as being true at the same time or what they sort of have to be led to understand can be true or yeah. can have room for growth or dynamism was one thing that was really important to me and Ahmad felt like a great vehicle through which to explore it and also I worked at like an aftercare place for like about five years or so oh. for a long time like I taught ESL so like working with young people was always fun and it was cool to get to write about folks working with younger people because you really don't see that yeah. you really don't see people work in American literary fiction let alone working in you know sort of child uh, education spaces so it, you know, yeah really fun to get to do that but it's also like you don't see a lot of books that take children seriously they just think like oh kids are there to like <laughs> I don't know, insert some weird kid joke or like do something childish and move on. But it's like, no, Ahmad is a very serious character in the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very it's very seldom that uh, I think characters from marginalized communities are treated like people in yeah. contemporary American literary fiction. And I think it's just as seldom to see children treated like people and capable of thought and dynamism in, you know, much of fiction. But that, you know, not really seeing the book that did that the way that I wanted to read it was an impetus for wanting to write a character like Ahmad. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, I think it's interesting that Ahmad and Mitsuko are, are you know, I guess two sides of the same coin. Um, no. I mean, I mean, very different. I, I don't want to say different coins, but yeah, like they kind of balance each other out in terms of they are the characters that are often the most outspoken. And I mean, Mitsuko, like she doesn't hold back ever, except for the one time she's gone off the margaritas and she's kind of, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like, you know. Like, oh, being... he told you that? I didn't uh, know he was going to tell you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I mean, she's, she's a character that's like, I don't know, it's, she, I, I just think she's not typical in any way. Like, to be put into a situation like that, and she's already like, all right, get up, come on, we're going to the grocery store, I'm going to cook this, you're going to learn how to cook, I know you don't know how, but it's time, it's time. <laughs> or just, you know, the idea that she's just like, oh, you're not going to pay? All right, I guess I'll pay. <laughs> so she's just, I mean, she's a riot of a character the whole time. Um, but I do love to see her kind of defenseless in the end where she's just totally broken down because I, I also felt like she just couldn't, she, it's that thing with the comfort again, where sure, you can give one person comfort in this situation, but it doesn't mean you can ensure comfort for the other person. So how do you choose, right? And, you know, that idea that in a way she almost chose Ben and she said like, this is all you got to do, you know? And I just thought that's so, so sweet that she would choose him, but also she can't choose for them anymore. Like, they have to choose for themselves. And I thought that was just so, yeah, like so much of this novel is is about choice and about being able to make those choices for yourself um, after, you know, having all the information that you need. Um, yeah, yeah, it was incredible. Okay, I think there are questions now. Um, that was not a smooth transition at all, but there are questions I'm here. I'm so grateful, Shana. Like, you, like to, <laughs> to be completely clear, I mean, to be read that way is like, a, it really is a gift. It's not an exaggeration or hyperbole, so thank you. Oh, no, thank you, man. I really enjoyed reading it. And again, like I said before, like, I've never read a novel like this. I mean, granted, I maybe am not that well read, but I have not read a novel like this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, they've got to stop expecting writers to read books. We're we're giving up on them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I am I gonna do the questions? Should I do it or I don't know if there's uh, okay, yes. All right, cool. Let me get in here and ask some questions. Um, so let's see. One question says, I'd love to hear about Memorial being picked up by A24 for a television series and what that experience was like finding out the news. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, it was an auction process. So between 10 and 14 folks bid in that auction and I spent most of July and also much of August in tandem with my film agent, Alice Laughlin, without whom I would not have been able to navigate it. Um, just talking to folks and really talking through the possibilities of what the show could be, their conceptions of what the narrative looked like, what was important to them, what they felt the emotional weight could look like, sort of concretized like on the screen. And there were many folks that we talked to that I felt like I could have made a really good show um and i you know was super stoked and grateful to be getting to work with a24 and the rudin team that we're working at tandem with because i think that our only ulterior motive as far as like the show is concerned is just to make something that we would want to watch yeah it, so it was a taxing process in that regard because it forces you to sort of approach the tax from a number of different angles, which can be demanding regardless of your proximity to it. Like, I don't think that having written the text made it a seamless um, endeavor, but it was also really important to me 
that I write it, which was one of a handful of sticking points that I had on my end because there was a certain way that I wanted to see it done. Yeah. And it felt important to me that given these particular characters that, you know, if I had the opportunity to, like if I had the privilege and was fortunate enough to be in a position to get to have a role in their transition to screen that I do that to the fullest extent of my ability. So many of the questions surrounding the auction were ones of themes of representation, of being open to casting a very, very wide net as far as casting is concerned, less yeah. out of credentials than in just who can play the role and who is the best fit for the role, whether that was in terms of I don't know, a character's physical appearance, like literally in, in terms of weight, there were only three entities that we talked to for whom that was something that came up, which is striking. And whether it was in terms of just like even the languages spoken on the screen, right? Like sort of really being intent that there weren't limitations imposed solely by the sort of expectations of the market when bringing this narrative to the screen so much yeah. as just doing the best that we could to be true to the book and also tell like a singular narrative on the screen it felt and feels very much like a24 and the Rubin team are just so keenly aware of that transition and committed to that transition so it feels like a real gift to get to work with them i mean and this will be so you took it from short story to novel and now novel to screenplay. Do you feel? <laughs> Absolute madness. Absolute madness. And it's just, it, doesn't, it doesn't make much structural sense to me either. I mean, I don't know. I mean, like how the book is written now, it feels like it could be a show. Like the way that it's moving in this kind of moment to moment. And I mean, I guess all shows don't do that. But yeah, there's something about it that already feels like you may not have a lot of work to do, but you know, what do I know? I haven't written a show, so. <laughs> no, I mean, I think that, that, I mean, speaking of like our respective like literary canons, like I'm someone for him, like just like growing up, like I was not the biggest reader to say the least, but I watched like a lot of film. And, yeah. And you know, I watched a lot of film foreign from the States in either case. And I think that that was a boon, even though I kind of articulated at the time and that once I did start writing, like my sort of sense of what a narrative could be and the structures and yeah. the could take wasn't already codified by like eight white men I had to read in high school, you know? So <laughs> it was really, you know, much of that, what does something look like is something that I'm thinking about as I work through fiction. Okay, wow, I'm excited for it. I mean, I guess it won't come out for a little bit, but still very exciting when it yeah <laughs> it'll be you know we're, we're you know we're doing meetings like i have a meeting tomorrow about it so we're like we're actively like writing it now so it's just trying to make sure everything like once we do have like the green light once everything is safe and like once everything is sort of sound yeah. you know, we can just sort of go yeah. oh man oh, okay so the next question is what do you think, I look like I can't read, but <laughs> what do you think happens in young to mid adulthood that shuts down people's capacity to sit with and accept life's complexities and multiplicity? Are time and speed a factor? I'm thinking about the fact that communicating with children and with seniors sometimes, not always, but sometimes, requires more patience than dealing with other young to middle aged folk. Uh. That's a, this is a Mitsuko Ahmad question. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. I was about to say, wow, that's like, I feel like I can answer. <laughs> After myself, I can't give like a general question. Um, I do think that as far as Memorial is concerned, because I can speak to that more directly, the question of context and the question of how someone conceives of themselves within that particular context certainly came into play. And I think that in trying to make Memorial a simulacrum of life, to take a character like Benson, who is, again, like black guy, queer, cis male, who exists within a certain context, 
in Houston, where there's not only who he is, but who he's been told to be by his family, by his partner, by his peers and his friends, and also who he wants to be, or perhaps how he sees himself. And the Venn diagram of those identities at the beginning of the novel doesn't intersect. And in many ways, it's through his interactions with Mitsuko and through his interactions with Ahmad that that Venn diagram moves closer and closer together, right? Because in many ways, Mitsuko, by way of just her age and experience, she can see through who Ben thinks that he should be. Yeah. And who perhaps he has created a pretense of being and speaks to him for who he is and who she sees that he is. And much of that speaking without pretense is jarring for him because for him, it's among the first times, aside from Mike in certain circumstances, where someone is communicating to him in that way, just as a person in lieu of an expectation. And I think that Ahmad is doing the same from the opposite end of it, right? And that he can just clearly approach Benson, not as this sort of archetype of who someone with his identity should be or should be perceived or should be interacted with in a specific way within Houston so much as a person that he is interacting with that is full of possibility. And so interacting with people that are willing and open to see the possibilities inside of a person, whether that's Benson interacting with Mitsuko and Ahmad, whether that's Mike interacting with his father, changes both Mike and Ben so that they're able to see the possibilities inside of others. Like this isn't just an older person or someone that can never yeah. understand me, or this isn't just like a younger person or someone that can never understand me so much as this is a person and they can occupy many different identities simultaneously and I can treat them as such and in treating them as such, I can, you know, further my conception of myself, right? Like in understanding the wants and desires and requirements of the folks around me, I can come up with a better understanding of my own wants and desires and requirements. But I think it's, it is, it's a transaction. And I think that an opening has to be there for each of those characters. One character has to make that concession in order for the transaction to begin. And in Vincent's case, it's just very fortunate that Mitsuko is willing to make that concession, uh, concession to sort of open the door to like make that first meal and Ahmad in entirely different ways is willing to do the same and that he just approaches Benson just as a person just asking for things without an ulterior motive just solely because yeah. he wants them and because he thinks that Benson can provide him and that is a clear cut relationship like of transactions yeah in the midst of Benson's having many different and perhaps many much more complicated relationships in which the terms of those transactions and interactions are significantly more muddled yeah yeah and I mean with what you're saying now reminds me a lot of what Iju says to Mike. And I can't remember if it's in a flashback that he says it, um, but he says, you need to decide what you look like now or someone's gonna decide for you. Um, and yeah, I feel like, you know, Mits Mitsuko and Ahmad, they've they've made their decision on who Ben <laughs> is, you know, like <laughs> you're, you know, you're the guy that's gonna help me get what I want, you know, in terms of a mod or you know you're the guy that is so concerned with all these other things happening around you that you're not actually seeing yourself or who you are in terms of Mitsuko so yeah I mean man I just I want to reread it and just totally <laughs> isolate all of a mod and Mitsuko's wow. words <laughs> just like a fan cam you know just making me fan cam just like if you know, anybody wants that like I <laughs> <laughs> Mitsuko just uh... 
<laughs> okay, um, so this one, last question from Rebecca Schneider. Once you knew you were writing about Osaka for a story, rather than just going for fun slash visiting friends, did you feel you experienced the city differently? And the same for Houston. Do you see the city through a different lens? So once you knew you could make bank off of these cities, did you decide? <laughs> <laughs> so so it, it, it's perhaps, I'm going to answer the question. It's a really great question. Like, thank you for, for asking it, but I think that for the latter part of that, I think it's perhaps crucial to note that this book was not written on contract, right? So Lot was a single contract, the memorial was a single contract. And I say that because I think that there can be an illusion as far as the way that books come together on the back end, right? Like this feeling of inevitability as far as like press run up is concerned and as far as like the magnification of a narrative. And, you know, it's in many different places and it feels as if they were preordained and that, that, that they are like set up in that way. And that is solely due to the work of my publicist and my publicist assistant, their energy and putting everything together and also the marketing team and also the design director, all of those folks, as far as like putting the book together, like as a product and as like, a entity in the sort of conversation of American literary fiction. But as far as the narrative is concerned, that there was no contract there. So it was, the book was done and then there was a contract. All of which I say to say that the fact of monetization did not make itself present or known until the book was done. And that had an impact and I think it was a beneficial impact to my conception of what the book could be and specifically how to interact with those places, whether Houston or Osaka, in that I was free to write the book and also those cities in the way that I wanted to, okay? in the way that I thought that I wanted to read them on the page. And for both of them, trying to conjure that warmth was what was most pressing to me and most fascinating to me. And while that was true, I think it's also true that a novel concerning the warmth of any particular geographic point, let alone Houston and Osaka, does not immediately yield like instant monetization to like any publisher in particular, right? Like that doesn't really scream like money, uh, but it was important to me. So for Osaka, as far as research is concerned, it consisted of a lot of talking to people, you know, of a lot of spending time in the sort of spaces and the sort of bars and the sort of intersections that Mike occupies, that Mike's father occupies, of the bar goers that proliferate Mike section occupy so that I could have a sense that if not a one-to-one -one sense, because I don't think that would have been possible so much as a sense of the sort of emotional pocket that each of the characters were navigating. And because I was writing outside of myself for Mike, I was writing outside of myself for every single character because none of them was me. But because I was writing about a place that I had not spent a significant amount of time in, there was an undue importance, at least for me, that I do the research and that I do the work, right? Like the question of whether or not I could write about characters occupying a space that I'm not a product of or that I haven't spent like an entire lifetime in wasn't really a question. Like the answer to that was yes. So the question for me became, why am I doing it and how do I do it so that I'm giving both this place and these characters the benefit of the doubt, giving them humanity and giving them the dynamism as a person that I would like to see every character have on the page. So there was a lot of talking to people, a lot of just spending time in many different spaces, a lot of just having conversations, and a very extensive amount of reading about the history of the city, the sort of history of the bar scene of the city and the way in which the bar scene revolved around the people that inhabit those bars, like how that scene in a lot of ways is comprised of many different homes, those bars, and how those homes are run by the people who attend them. So really immersing myself in the research of it was something that 
surfaced once the project became a project that, you know, I started working on it, Ernest as far as Osaka is concerned. And for Houston, the process honestly wasn't different at all, really, particularly because much of Memorial, as far as like Houston is concerned, takes place in the third ward, specifically yeah. with snippets and trips other places. It felt deeply important to me to have that informational foundation set as far as facts are concerned, as far as street names are concerned, as far as images yeah. are concerned, as far as what something actually looks like is concerned. So that when it came to the fiction of it and when it came to the emotional pocket of it, I had a bit more flexibility because that foundation was already there. So again, like a lot of reading, a lot of talking to people, a lot of just spending time in those spaces without even having a sort of direct aim, right? Or like a direct goal, even just like walking around the neighborhood, right? Like for yeah. Osaka, like I walked around that city at all hours, <laughs> like literally, literally at all hours um, on, on many, many, many different occasions, just to have a sense of like what it felt like to walk around that city in the evening in the way that Mike and Tan, they walk with one another in one particular scene, the entirety of a night. And it felt important to me to know how that felt. So there are many different evenings where I could just walk, whether with a friend, whether with friends or just by myself, just to have a sense yeah. of what that emotional pocket felt like. And the same was true for the third war, right? Like what would it feel like for Ben to have a sort of epiphany at sunset or at dusk on a particular street? So to go to that particular street around that same time around myself, just to sort of see what it looks like visually and to see what the sort of emotional pocket one would have to occupy in order to have that feeling. Um, all of that was really important and it felt just as crucial to me as the actual drafting of it and actual editing of it because I think, you know, again, the stability of that foundation allowed me to play with the emotional sphere and allowed me to play with the ambiance because the reader could always lean into the fact that while any number of things may have been volatile characters, their relationships or sort of intersections around one another, the places, the geographic points that they occupied, like those had to be woven like really tight, like they had to be really sound. And that was something that was and is important to me, partly because it just makes for a better book. I think partly because you don't want to embarrass the people that you care about and embarrass the people that you know live in and occupy those spaces, you know? Yeah. So just copious, copious, copious um, research. I wanted to ask very briefly about uh, the photo. Ben only sends one photo in the end. Um, and it's like, as soon as I saw that house, I thought that looks familiar, but it was actually <laughs> the... Um, the little condo townhouses in the back that I was like, oh, is this on? I mean, I thought that it was on Blodgett. I could be wrong. No, um, you're right. Okay. <laughs> no, yeah, no, no, you're right. Yeah. No, you're right. <laughs> but it just, I don't, I mean, it worked for me because I was just like, oh yeah, this whole time, you know, you've been describing these very particular things about Third Ward and this idea that like, it's kind of a massive neighborhood in terms of you can go to one part of it and it looks nothing like the other part of it. And, you know, I even thought like, oh, the house that I lived in in Third Ward for five years doesn't seem like any, you know, it doesn't seem like the house that Ben and Mike are in. It doesn't seem like the same part. Um, but yeah, once I saw the photo, I was like, oh, I know exactly where they're at. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the process of choosing so photos for the book was, was pretty tricky and strenuous and perhaps only tricky and strenuous to me. I was really lucky and that like when I pitched it to my editor, she didn't just like dunk on me and then like when we pitched it to the <laughs> design team, they didn't just dunk on us. But for that particular photo, it was important to me to have a home that I think is like a beautiful home, but also to have like a glimpse of a world beyond that home and a glimpse yeah. of the world beyond the ones that the characters are occupying. That is in fact a part of the same world because it's important to me to yeah. sort of understand that many different narratives can occupy the same space and they can all be true yeah yeah I mean for sure as soon as I saw it I was like yeah man this is the house there's the gentrification slightly in the back <laughs> yeah, just slightly <laughs> just creeping in uh, like down. Yeah. all right well thank you so much Brian I mean this was a great conversation I really don't I'm really grateful Shana like yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean to think that I haven't seen you in five years is nuts but to see you like That's this and, 
to see you out here, you know, winning, like it's so, uh, so awesome. So yeah, thanks, thanks for putting on for Houston and yeah, man, this is Memorial's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Wilkes. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you so much, Ryan and Shana. Um, if we weren't on Zoom, I would let the conversation flow. Um, I'm enjoying being a, a fly on the virtual wall listening to your um, exchange. So thank you um, both. Um, so um, I just wanna remind people that Memorial is in bookstores and libraries now. So please um, check it out if you haven't already. And Please keep an eye out for the fiction of Shana Frazier. This is a manuscript on my iPad, but I hope that you will be able to access yes, it please in do other that. forms yes. soon, so keep your eye out. Um, thank you for coming, and let me apologize. I was so excited at the beginning that I forgot to thank my colleagues in the New Writers Project, um, who um, not only supplied our interlocutor tonight, um, but um, also um, generously supported this event. Um, they are also fabulous colleagues, so Lisa Olstein, Elizabeth McCracken, and Emma Train. Um, thank you for all that you've done, Justice, and for everyone who's come. Um, take care and stay safe, and have a good night, everyone.